being recent. All right, so uh, chapter 29 looks at uh, 1989, again, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union uh, up through uh, 2001, which is the September 11th attacks. So technically the 90s, but with a little bit before and after. When the Soviet Union falls, uh, two major things happen. One, there's a whole bunch of countries that used to be communist that are no longer communist. So for example, East Germany, which you should recognize, uh, reunifies with West Germany. Uh, but in addition to formerly communist places no longer being communist, the borders and boundaries of Russia uh, change as well. Because the modern day Russia that we know today uh, is geographically smaller as some of the places that were part of the Soviet Union directly uh, got their independence and became their own separated countries. Uh, and so that is part of this big shift. Note that even after the Soviet Union is no longer itself and Russia is no longer communist, uh, there are still communist countries in the form of North Korea, of China, of Cuba, and potentially others, depending on how loose you want to be with definitions. Uh, but at this point, the main uh, adversary in the Cold War is over, and so the United States celebrates uh, Goas. 1989 sees not only the fall of the Berlin Wall, but also sees uh, international protests in favor of democracy. Uh, one of the places where that happens is in China. Some of you may have seen this photo before of uh, the figure on the left who's referred to as Tank Man. Uh, that's just sort of the nickname. Uh, allegedly, the Chinese government doesn't know who it is uh, or was and doesn't know anything about them. Uh, nobody else does, so we, we have no information. All we know is that there were uh, students uh, as well as others protesting at, at Tiananmen Square uh, in favor of democracy. Uh, the Chinese government sent in military, and so these tanks are on their way to uh, stop both including killing as well as not uh, the protesters. And then this guy is standing over here in front of the tanks, uh, effectively daring them to run him over. Uh, note that this is a cropped photo. This photo, I think, is much more impressive because it shows that there's it's not just four tanks, which is already impressive as hell. There's like twice that many and more going off camera of uh, just a seemingly an infinite array of tanks that he's uh, uh, single-handedly stopping them, at least for the time being. Uh, curiously, if you search for Tiananmen Square protests uh, in the UK or anywhere else, you find a bunch of photos, including the one that I just shared with you. If, however, you're in inside China and you search uh, on uh, Chinese Google for Tiananmen Square protests, you find a bunch of uh, photos either of uh, the kind of military parades or of the actual building itself, but a whole bunch of things that are not uh, the protests and, and certainly not uh, the tanks. And so this is reflective of how, although China has certainly opened up and has welcomed uh, capitalism and foreign investment into China, it still remains a totalitarian government that has strict controls over information uh, and, and censors uh, the access to uh, communication that people have there. So from my understanding, a lot of people use VPNs and, and get around it, but uh, at least the official Chinese policy is that uh, the Tiananmen Square protests didn't happen and these things over here are the thing that uh, people in the country have uh, have access to. Uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, one of the first major uh, international operations the United States has is with the first Iraq war. Uh, this happens during H.W. Bush's presidency, uh, which you'll note is before George W. Bush. Uh, after the September 11th attacks, George W. Bush invades Iraq uh, looking for weapons of mass destruction, which, you know, if you're interested, we can look at after the AP exam. For our purposes, uh, the country of Kuwait was allegedly drilling in Iraqi oil fields. All right, they, they share a border and allegedly, according to Iraq, Kuwait had oil uh, drills that were drink, drilling at an angle, uh, effectively stealing oil from Iraq. And when Iraq told Kuwait to stop, Kuwait was like, nah, that's okay. Uh, and so Iraq invaded Kuwait from their stated purpose in order to stop Kuwait from stealing their oil. The United States, as well as a number of other countries, uh, invade on behalf of Kuwait uh, and win a decisive victory. Uh, but one of the things that makes this different from earlier examples is that there's no longer a Cold War. There's no Soviet Union. There's no primary antagonist outside of Iraq. And that makes this kind of the one of the first demonstrations of uh, US superpower status that, at least in the short term, it seems like there's no, there's no real uh, countervailing force. There's no um, opposition, uh, the United States defeats the Iraqi military, uh, you know, almost like it was a training exercise. Uh, and, and that theoretically indicates that America's uh, military and diplomatic supremacy is, uh, is uh, unchallenged. Uh, 
the United States signs uh, an agreement called uh, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, it's come up in the news over the last couple of years because uh, Donald Trump has criticized it. He is not a fan of international anything, certainly not trade deals. The idea behind it was that Canada, the United States, and Mexico would all reduce their tariffs on each other's goods, allowing for more free trade between these countries, and in particular, allowing the United States to more effectively compete with either China, maybe the European Union, but with other uh, major international economic players. Uh, if we look back, because this was passed about 25, 30 years ago, the general trend, and there's obviously exceptions, but broadly speaking, uh, NAFTA has been good for consumers because it's easier for stuff to travel between countries so people in all three places can buy stuff more cheaply. Uh, it's generally speaking been good for companies because they're able to um, you know, uh, put investments uh, and or move between the countries more easily than they used to be, uh, not only the company itself, but also the goods and services that they're uh, supporting. Uh, the big loser, broadly speaking, has been the workers because the workers are no longer only competing with people in their own country, they're also competing with workers from the other countries. Uh, and so it's often in the United States, we hear complaints about, oh, well, Mexican labor is so cheap that it's unfair and Mexico is really benefiting. But actually Mexican workers uh, have been harmed like all other workers have. In particular, uh, American farmers get a whole bunch of subsidies from the government that Mexican farmers do not. So you have Mexican farmers who are trying to compete not only with more auto automated, uh, more industrialized farming techniques, but ones that also get government subsidies, and it has not been good for uh, a lot of Mexican workers either. Uh, the early 1990s also sees the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, I don't have any recollection of it, but uh, apparently, including when I was a child, uh, elevators were not common in buildings. Uh, uh, Places didn't have to have wheelchair ramps. Uh, sidewalks with the little curb cuts that allow uh, wheelchairs or people with mobility issues to uh, move between sidewalk and crosswalk, those weren't widespread. Uh, Munibuses used to not lower and raise. Uh, and so all those things that we kind of just take for granted nowadays, uh, like, you know, I have weak ankles, so I sprain my ankle occasionally. And boy, is it useful to have elevators when, when I sprain my ankle. Um, it's even more important for people who, you know, have some uh, limited mobility issues uh, permanently. And uh, the expectation prior to the Americans with Disabilities Act was, well, either deal with it, or maybe you just stay home or in a facility someplace forever, and you never get to leave, and you never get to contribute or participate in society. Uh, and so it's relatively recent that the Americans with Disability Act was passed, and people nowadays kind of take for granted, but uh, it was a result of protest by uh, as illustrated in this image, uh, folks, many of whom use wheelchairs, demanding uh, that they have uh, civil rights like people who don't have uh, some kind of physical disability. Uh, the early 90s also sees the case of Rodney King. Uh, the photo on the left is him uh, taken uh, shortly after uh, being uh, attacked by the police. Uh, in the image on the right, this is a still from a short video that was taken. Note that back in these days, there were no cell phone cameras. So there was a guy who just happened to have a video camera and recorded uh, the incident. Uh, There's four police officers who pulled uh, over Rodney King uh, for uh, speeding and erratic driving. Uh, according to their testimony, he uh, fought back against them before the video started. Uh, he uh, pushed past them. And so they uh, had to use force in order to stop him. Uh, but uh, the ultimate investigation and trial of the four officers uh, found them uh, not be one of the one of the four officers. Uh, they did not find them either guilty or not guilty. Uh, but in case in uh, the early 90s, there were uh, riots, uh, both in LA, where the attack and the trial happened. Uh, and actually in San Francisco as well, they also uh, declared um, a curfew uh, in order to uh, uh, prevent uh, and, and limit uh, any sort of uh, unrest. And so you can draw direct parallels without having to think too hard between, say, for example, uh, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and the uh, protests during the summer, uh, and then some of the things happening in uh, uh, the early 90s um, with the case of Rodney King. Uh, similarly, with uh, questions of the criminal justice system, uh, O.J. Simpson, who is a football player, uh, actually from San Francisco, I think he went to Galileo High School, uh, who was a football player and then became an actor, was accused of having killed his ex-wife uh, and the ex-wife's boyfriend. Um, the image on the right from Time Magazine, you'll notice, is multiple shades darker, and there were no shortage of people complaining, WTF time, there, there's this guy who's accused of murder, and you're like, intentionally darkening the photo, how, 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 how long did you work to be that racist? Uh, and so Time Magazine apologized, but you know they had they had all, 
like multiple people had to agree to it before it hit newsstands. And I'm not too sure why they, they didn't stop that uh, before it, it hit the uh, uh, public. Uh, in any case, O.J. Simpson was found not guilty in the criminal trial. Uh, he was later sued uh, as a result of a civil trial. Uh, and during this uh, civil trial, uh, he was found guilty. The reason is not a change in evidence. The reason is because in civil trials, which have to do with money and not jail time, you only have to prove the person 51% guilty, simply that it was more likely than not that they were responsible. In a criminal case, you have to prove the person guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And as a result, the criminal trial was unsuccessful, but the civil trial was successful. And so uh, O.J. Simpson was held responsible financially and had to pay compensation to the uh, victims' families. I just realized, I noticed over here on the upper right of this one, it says gays. Uh, they talk about uh, Stonewall, uh, the 25th anniversary. So, you know, the Stonewall riots and during the 90s, there was certainly a lot of attention paid to, uh, I don't know, uh, LGBTQ rights. And that's uh, an odd, you know, kind of random thing in the background to see. Uh, the 1992 election is remarkable for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is that uh, Ross Perot, as a third party candidate, gets almost 20% of the vote. So if you look at their electoral vote, it's like, oh, yeah, slam dunk. Of course, Bill Clinton is going to win. But in the popular vote, it was extraordinarily close. Most of Ross Perot's voters came from H.W. Bush running for re-election. Uh, and so the third party candidate, as is often the case, spoils the election for the uh, candidate who's ideologically aligned and gives the election to the opponent. And so this election is extraordinarily similar to the one in um, 1912, where you have, in that case, Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, who wins because there's a third party candidate, in his case, Teddy Roosevelt, who takes votes away from the Republican, in his case, uh, Taft. But uh, a similar thing happens in 1992. And so uh, Bill Clinton wins with a minority, 43% of Americans uh, who voted for him, voting for him. Uh, one of the most ambitious proposals that the Clinton administration has uh, is massive health care reform, uh, which is uh, more radical than the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, and is actually much more in line to the proposals that the more radical members of Congress have nowadays. It fails for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is opposition to uh, Hillary Clinton. This is her before she was a senator or a secretary of state or a presidential candidate. And uh, part of the opposition to it was, for starters, fears over socialism. You know, the Cold War is over, but there's still Americans who are worried about socialism and communism coming into the country. Uh, and on some level, uh, also opposition to her uh, being so public about policy positions. All right. uh, she was a lawyer, uh, a practicing lawyer prior to becoming first lady. Uh, and so she had lots of experience, uh, not just in health, uh, health reform, but also more broadly in, in the law. Um, but when people saw that she was taking a non-traditional role of leading the charge on, you know, taking on health insurance companies, uh, there were a lot of Americans who were uneasy with that. And so, for example, if you look at uh, the different issues that first ladies have, uh, Melania Trump arguably was against cyberbullying. Um, uh, Michelle Obama was opposed to uh, unhealthy foods and, and uh, childhood obesity. Uh, Laura Bush, George W. Bush's wife, was concerned about uh, literacy. And you'll notice that all of those are very kind of safe, traditional uh, women's roles. If, if some person was sexist, they'd be like, oh, well, they are allowed to care about those things because they're mothers, so it makes sense for them to care about them. But in the case of healthcare reform, that is not traditionally, you know, a woman's responsibility. And that is, uh, at least to my and other people's analysis, one of the reasons why there's such kind of virulent opposition to Hillary Clinton as the 2016 candidate, all traced back to her proposals for healthcare reform uh, in, the, in the early 90s that were both too ambitious and also how dare she as a woman uh, who wasn't elected uh, lead the charge to uh, expand healthcare. Uh, during Clinton's administration, and this is, I think, one of the best examples of how Clinton, while he was a Democrat, ultimately his presidency had a whole bunch of conservative elements, uh, passed something called the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA. You'll note the phrasing, defense of marriage, that implies that marriage is under attack. The context for DOMA is that individual states were legalizing same-sex marriage. And according to a part of the Constitution called the Full Faith and Credit Clause, if you have a document in one state, that document is valid in other states. So, for example, if I have a driver's license from California, I can drive in other states also. And you know, maybe within six months, I have to get a license there. But the, the, the driver's license or marriage or death certificate, whatever, is equal. 
And states that didn't want same-sex marriage were so terrified that same-sex couples would get married in some other state and then come to their state that Congress passed a law defining marriage as only between a man and a woman that uh, effectively invalidated same-sex marriages that had been performed in states where it was legal. It is not until Obama's presidency, i.e. within your lifetimes, that the Supreme Court found same-sex marriage uh, to be protected by the 14th Amendment. Uh, and as a result, same-sex marriage becomes legal you know, years after this and only through the courts, not by, uh, by public opinion. Uh, this chart over here indicates, uh, don't worry about the text, there's a whole bunch of, of uh, a text that is you know, arguably more detailed than it needs to be. Uh, the solid red line indicates interracial marriage. And you'll note that interracial marriage becomes legal literally decades before it becomes popular, right? It's not until 1995, which I don't understand, but you know, I don't understand many things, uh, but not until 1995 that a majority of Americans are okay with uh, interracial marriage, right? Literally decades between when it becomes legal versus when it becomes popular. On the flip side, same-sex marriage becomes popular majority in 2011, uh, and it's not until you know 2012, I think, is when this came out that um, a majority of the population lived in states where it was legal. So, with interracial marriage, it became legal before it became popular, and with same-sex marriage, it became popular before it became legal. This was uh, published uh, before the Supreme Court decision, but the the trend is is clearly upward by the time the Supreme Court rules on it. Uh, Bill Clinton is impeached but not removed from office. Uh, the circumstances for his case uh, involved uh, an allegation of sexual harassment. He had to testify under oath while he was president saying that he did not have any sexual relations with anyone besides his wife. Uh, it was revealed that he did have sexual relations with a woman named Monica Lewinsky who was an intern uh, working in the White House. Uh, I remember very distinctly in the late 1990s, just like uh, every single uh, late night comedian was just making jokes constantly at Monica Lewinsky's expense. Uh, and since then, they've apologized. Since then, she's become one of the foremost advocates uh, in favor of victims' rights and um, uh, advocating uh, against uh, cyberbullying. Um, but in any case, uh, Bill Clinton's testimony under oath that he did not have sexual relations was used by Republicans in order to impeach him. Note that his lie had nothing to do with policy, right? He was not like he was lying about illegally funding uh, war criminals like Ronald Reagan did. His lie had to do with who he had sex with. Um, ultimately, the vote, as was earlier the case, was strictly along party lines. And the ultimate result is that Clinton was impeached but not removed from office. Uh, I, not identical, but very, very similar to uh, Andrew Johnson. Uh, in both cases, they're Democrats. In both cases, they're impeached by Republican House. In both cases, they were not removed from office uh, very closely along party lines. And then, of course, we saw uh, Donald Trump got impeached, but not removed twice, also along party lines. So, you know, uh, history is a circle. Uh, the 2000 election is uh, remarkable for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is, again, there's a third party candidate. Uh, uh, Ralph Nader, as a member of the Green Party, takes more votes away from Al Gore than he does from Bill Clinton, or so from um, uh, George W. Bush. And so that is a similarity. Uh, but the uh, most noteworthy part, you'll notice that the electoral vote is extraordinarily close. And the popular vote, the guy who won the popular vote is not the one who won the electoral vote. So the same thing happens in 2016 as happens in 2000. And it actually, it, most of American history, popular and electoral votes have gone together. During my lifetime, I've had multiple elections that the popular vote winner didn't get the electoral vote. And that has to do with which states get how many electoral votes um, as illustrated on this map. Uh, there was all sorts of allegations of uh, wrongdoing uh, in the case of uh, Florida, uh, that state's 25 votes easily would have made or ma made or broken the difference between the two candidates. Uh, and the fact that it was controlled by Republicans, including specifically George W. Bush's brother, Jeb Bush was the governor of Florida, uh, led to, to no shortage of theories that the election was rigged in favor of uh, George W. Bush rather than Al Gore. But even with no rigging, uh, the fact that the popular and the electoral votes were mismatched uh, indicates that the United States is definitely not uh, a democracy. We are a representative system that, you know, maybe represents the minority more than the majority. In the year 2000, surprisingly, there were people who were legitimately afraid that the world was going to end. Uh, computers uh, tracked the tens and ones year digit, but not the hundreds or thousands. So people were afraid that when January 1st, 2000 hit, computers were going to think it was January 1st, 1900, and 
this in this case this is a, a horrifically exaggerated this is this is the worst clickbait before clickbait was a thing uh where they were exaggerating uh people did not realistically think that you know uh the stock market would crash or that uh cars would stop working but there were concerns for example about electricity because power plants require uh timing systems that may be thrown off based on the date obviously the world didn't end um but there was legitimate fear for uh, what was called y2k uh, Y2K standing for year 2000, that uh, historians and uh, analysts argue is the reason why there's the modern day prepper movement. Like the, the idea that people are going to stockpile years worth of food in their bunker below their house. Like there's no longer fear of nuclear war, but there's fear of Y2K, fear of COVID pandemic, fear of civil war. And that modern day attitude can be at least in part traced back to uh, Y2K. Ultimately, the United States uh, does face a tragedy, not on 2000, but instead September 11th, 2001. Uh, four planes are hijacked, two fly into the World Trade Centers, one flies into uh, the Pentagon, and one flies, uh, we're actually not sure of the destination, it ultimately crashes uh, in uh, rural Pennsylvania as the passengers on the plane attack the hijackers and try to seize control of it, uh, but the plane crashes uh, instead. Uh, a couple local connections, uh, the Flight 93, the specific one that was crashed, uh, or it crashed into the field, that one uh, was a flight between I believe New Jersey and San Francisco. So there were, you know, half the passengers were from the SF Bay. Uh, and in particular, one of Washington's uh, alumni, uh, a woman named Betty Ong, was a flight attendant who uh, was one of a handful of people who used uh, phones on the plane because the uh, phones. Uh, phones existed on planes, uh, used that to call ground control and verify that other planes had been hijacked and that those other planes had been crashed into targets. Uh, it's worth noting that in the 1970s in particular, there were actually a lot of planes that were hijacked and almost all of them were safely landed someplace and the hijacker got what they wanted or maybe not, but uh, hijacked planes were landed safely lots of times in the 70s. So in 2001, when this happened, no one was expecting or anticipating it, but Pretty much everyone nowadays, I think, even you all who are born after it, if you're on a plane that gets hijacked, you know that there's this is at least a possibility. So uh, the planes were hijacked, not exactly simultaneously. Uh, United 93 was hijacked a little bit later than the other ones. And so by the time that they were able to talk to people on ground control, uh, there was pretty clear information that multiple sites had been flown into that were under attack. Uh, and so the passengers with that information uh, made the choice to attack the hijackers. Uh, if you're curious, um, and if you're in the mood to cry, uh, I recommend searching for, uh, you should be able to find uh, recordings uh, f uh, from uh, the planes. Uh, and, you know, like I said, you can uh, just make sure that you're in the proper emotional state before you, uh, you listen to those, because they are, uh, I, I don't want to say that every single person who listens to them will cry, but I think like the overwhelming majority. <laughs> 